Sage's Stories. Welcome to today's episode of Sage's Stories, the official podcast of Sage's, the Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons. Please make sure to hit the like button and subscribe so you can stay up to date with our most recent episode and enjoy the show. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to episode 14 of Sage's Stories, where we shine the light on some of Sage's most impactful leaders. This is our first podcast of the new year, 2023, and we are excited to share it with you. I'm your co-host, Dr. Kevin O'Hayek from Cleveland, Ohio. And hello, I'm Dr. Sharin Tofai from very rainy Los Angeles, California. A rare thing. I know. Happy New Year, Kevin. Happy New Year. Uh, Pretty excited to start off the new year with another great Sages story. How about you? Absolutely. It's so hard to believe we're entering the third calendar year of Sages Stories podcast. It seems like yesterday where you were so young, Kevin, when you started. It, it really does. What, you don't think I look young anymore? <laughs> I mean, pandemics tends to bring out, the, bring out the wrinkles a little bit. I don't know. All right. All right. I admit uh, that you aren't the only person to mention that. And I, I blame it on the, the pandemic beard, which our guests <laughs> can't see, but In any case, uh, today's guest is Dr. Bruce Shermer. He has been a surgical leader and SAGE's leader for not just many years, but many decades. Uh, Bruce hails from Jersey City, New Jersey, and is currently the Stephen H. Watts Professor and Vice Chair of the Department of Surgery at the University of Virginia, where he has been on faculty since 1985. Like many of our guests, uh, Bruce's list of accolades is quite lengthy, so I'll just highlight a few. He has been a director of the American Board of Surgery and was the founder, founding president of the American College of Surgeons Bariatric Surgery Center's Network Committee. He was also president of multiple surgical societies, including the American Hepatopancreato Biliary Association, AHPBA, the Society of Clinical Surgery, and the Fellowship Council. Uh, Bruce was also a governor of the American College of Surgeons and serves as an editorial board member of six journals. And of course, he was president of SAGES in 2002 to 2003. Welcome to SAGES Stories, Bruce. Thank you very much, Kevin. Appreciate it. Um, Welcome, Bruce. If you've listened to our prior podcast, you would know that our goal with each SAGES Stories is to know the past, present, and future SAGES leaders beyond their prowess in the OR. Um, We all love surgery, but we also know that there's more to a surgeon than what we do in the OR. So um, we know your story will be very inspiring. Every story is so unique. I love people's stories. It's just like, and and I love that we do this podcast just for that reason. So let's start with you maybe sharing a little about your background. Where'd you grow up and what were some of the key moments along your journey to becoming a surgeon? Yeah, well, thank you, Sharon. Yeah. um, So I was born in uh, New Jersey. Uh, in 1953, and um, I lived in a nice. small suburban town, uh, so basically a suburb town of New York. It was uh, way up in the north uh, west corner of um, northeast, rather corner of New Jersey, near the George Washington Bridge. So I grew up there, went to high school there. Um, my summer job in high school was a caddy. I learned a lot about uh, personalities and people under stress. Uh, and uh, enjoyed the job a lot because I got to work outdoors, um, carry, carried a couple bags around for 36 holes, and I got in pretty good shape. At that point in my life, I was pretty interested in sports, and I was um, I played uh, sports in high school, but I was primarily interested in football and uh, played fo- was able to be able to play football in college as well. Uh, when I finished um, and graduated from Northern Valley Regional High School in 1971, I attended Princeton University for four years, where I had four fantastic years. It was just wonderful experience. Uh, I did, as I said, play football there, but had a great time. It's a great university. I have great loyalty to it. I go back to reunions yeah. regularly, keep in touch with my Princeton uh, friends. I had two guys who I roomed with for four years. We've been lifelong friends for life. We talk to each other every month, and uh, it's been a great uh, thing. Not only that, but my oldest daughter went to Princeton and graduated in 2003. So now we have reasons to go back for her reunions as well. So we, we spent we spent some time going back there and and uh, it's just a great place. 
Do, do they so, match up? Do they are they five? Are they the equal five years? No, you actually no, no. she's an 03, I'm an 05. Oh, so, you just um, missed it. Yeah. But the good the, it's good right now because uh her kids are eight and five. And so this May, when they go to reunions for their 20th, we will go and watch the kids while they go party. Nice. That is so cool. Did you do that, Kevin? Do you do your high like a college? Yeah. Reunions? Yeah. I mean, it, it got a little bit messed up with the pandemic. Obviously, it went to virtual for a couple of mine. So it's uh, well, one of mine. So looking forward to getting back there. I wish I yeah. had that. I went to UCLA. It was such an enormous public school, basically, that we don't really do reunions. Yeah. Princeton, yeah. So Princeton was great. And uh, but I went there uh, thinking I probably wanted to pursue medicine, although I hadn't really thought of that until I was a senior in high school. So it was a pretty novel idea and um, did pre-med stuff. I graduated with a biology major, decided I did want to go to med school during Princeton because I worked for a summer in New York in a hospital. And um, and that seemed pretty, pretty good. Um, and uh, pursued medical school when I when it came time to look for medical schools. Uh, we, I applied to a, a number of them, but I got into Duke earl, earliest of the ones that I really wanted to go to. And all it took was a weekend down in Durham in December where it was 65 degrees. And I had just come from New Jersey where it was, you know, 32 degrees. And I was like, yeah, I could do this. So, <laughs> it's um, amazing how, how that changes things. Uh, I, yeah, it was just, yeah. plus I, I, we kind of wanted to get away from New Jersey. Uh, my wife and I were, um, uh, engaged and we, we were going to be married in the summer. We kind of wanted to get away a little bit. And um, so we moved to Durham and uh, she supported me through med school. I um, uh, finished med school in three and a half years because you could go through if you wanted to and not take vacation. So I did that. And then I was fortunate enough to be able to match in surgery at Duke and stayed there and just did my residency to follow. So I did a decade in Durham that accomplished both medical school and residency and, and some research and got it all done. And we had a good time in Durham. It was, but it was hard. I mean, back then yeah. when you were a resident, you uh, didn't sleep a lot. You were up for 36 hours and uh, off for 12. And of those 12, if you were lucky, you got six hours of sleep. So, uh, and when you were on duty, you didn't get much sleep at all. So it was a whole different lifestyle and I don't wish it on anybody. <laughs> and Duke's especially, Duke was especially a malignant program compared to other programs, I think. Well, you know, it, it, it really, I don't think it was a malignant program in the sense that uh, we all we all support each other and got along well. And actually, our our chair was very supportive, uh, as long as you did follow his rules. It was really simple. He had pretty yeah. straightforward rules. I mean, uh, you couldn't wear your scrubs outside the OR, and if you did, you were in trouble. Um, and uh, But he was very loyal to the people once he took them in the program. And so Duke got this reputation for people going forever. And, and what actually happened was during the Vietnam War, a bunch of guys got drafted and had to go in the service. And then when they came back, he had he had no room for them to finish them. You, there's a certain number of people you can finish every year in a certain oh, training. Wow. Program. Yeah. And so instead of telling those people to go find another place to train, he kept them, let them do lab time, and then gradually kept bringing them out and, and letting them finish their training. But it got, it was true. I mean, people were hanging around, not knowing until May, whether you're going to be what your next, what you were going to do next. And it was, it was really bad for some of those guys. They had to wait for a couple of years, but he did. Was it a, uh, was it a pyramidal system when you were there? No, no, oh, okay. it wasn't. Um, if you got, but they did have a separate sort of track for the cardiac guys going into cardiac surgery and the guys going into general surgery. So, it, and, but there were a certain number of spots for each one. I didn't know it was not pyramidal, but they were, there were people waiting around to get those spots. So in this, in that sense, there was a little bit of competition for those spots, but yeah, but it wasn't, if he could have finished more, he would have, but he couldn't. So, so in and that did sense, you have... he actually thought it was great of him to do that. Um, but um, yeah. So did you have family members in medicine that you kind of maybe no, really I'm were the first? Yep. Absolutely. The first doctor in the family. Yeah. And then you were a surgeon. That's amazing. Yeah. So, and then yeah, surgery just, I didn't know when going into med school, what I was going to do until about the third day of my surgery rotation. I said, yeah, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty much the same story for all of us. You know, you just do surgery, even if you thought you wanted to do something else and you're like, nope, that's it. Yep. Surgery yeah, it was is. pretty clear. Absolutely. What else did you think you wanted to do? Um, well, I like to 
when I did my GYN rotation, I liked the, the GYN aspect of OBGYN. Yeah. It was yeah. Surgical. yeah. That seems to be um, a, also a, a common yeah, and, usually and crossover I, um, there. When I had worked in um the, the guy I it was a Princeton alumnus who was a head of the GI division of at um St. Vincent's Hospital in New York, and he got me the summer job in New York during college, and I worked in a GI unit. So I was very familiar with endoscopy and working in an endoscopy unit. So I kind of thought I might want to do gastroenterology as well. So. Cool. so, you know, obviously you then, after you finished, you you took a post at uh, at UVA. We'll, we'll hear a little bit more about that. And, you know, when we, I know you and, and know of your your practice and see you in a lot of the societies that that I'm involved with and AHPBA and, and foregut and, you know, SSAT, it's, it's clear from your CV and your practice that your, your practice is quite broad in an era of super subspecialization. For example, Sharon only specializes in left-sided inguinal hernias on, on female <laughs> uh, stars in, uh, in uh, Beverly Hills. So what are your reflections about a broad surgical practice and, and how did you develop and really master it um you know we because uh we were in the hospital so much we got a lot of experience during our training doing a lot of different things and um i felt pretty comfortable when i came out of my training and started as an attending that i could i could do most operations not great but i could do most of them and and as i had more experience with them got better at them so everything, pretty much everything in the GI tract, I felt comfortable with, um, and um, and I did a lot of that for a long time. I was um, uh, I did a lot of colorectal surgery in my practice up until we had a, two guys that came in boarded in colorectal surgery. So I gave the cases to them. Uh, in the beginning, the most common case I did the first year in terms of major cases was was mass, was a modified radical mastectomy and. Then we got some breast specialists and I, when they came on faculty, I started giving my breast cases to them and uh, so and so on and so forth. And I used to do endocrine surgery until we got an endocrine specialist and then I gave my cases to him. <laughs> and so nice. you know, it kind of got, kind of got whittled down uh, to where I now just mainly do uh, uh, foregut, bariatric, uh, hernias, um, still do a little bit of HPV and that's about it. Um, I The only thing I didn't do when I came out of... Um, I remember when I, I applied for faculty privileges and they asked me what I wanted to do. I said, the only things I didn't want to do, I did not want to do transplants. Because back then, they if if I wanted to do a kidney transplant, they would let me. There weren't any really criteria to doing transplants. You right. want to do them, you could do them. And um, we weren't doing livers yet. And um, what made you I, decide to limit that aspect what was it about those are you kidding, <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> well you did you did a tough residency I all mean, days weekends and evenings so so it was it was a yeah no it was a, just a lifestyle decision then yeah i could just see you know that was uh that was immunosuppression any time of the day or night and all that other stuff i was just like yeah no i don't think so because i had seen i mean during during my residency we did a lot of kidney transplants and it was the transplant rotation was totally crazy you just never knew when you're going to be busy and when you're going to be sitting around and you couldn't plan very well and it didn't seem like a really i mean surgery's hard enough why add all that <laughs> so yeah that was the way i looked a at special it special crew for that yeah and i also we, did we hold not... a special place for yeah i also did hpb and then not transplant and i also yeah. said I, I don't you know uh, we have a great fellowship for transplant surgery and i'm gonna just do the hpb yeah, I know they're great cases, and I'm sure that you know, and it's a lot of fun doing them. But um, but it's tough uh, in terms of uh, your schedule. It just it's really weird. So, um, and the other thing I didn't do was vascular surgery. So I decided early on not to do that either. So, so that, and then I pretty much did all general surgery, and just uh, as time went by, you know, there weren't any fellowships back then. Back then, if you wanted to specialize in something, uh, you would go to an institution where there was a mentor and spend a year with that person. And so it was a very informal relationship, but that was essentially what a fellowship was. So we had, in my in my institution, Scott Jones was the liver surgeon and he would have uh, one person a year that would come and work with him and learn how to do liver surgery and, mm -hmm. and go off and, and, and do that. So um, formal fellowships were limited to the, um, the, uh, the current ACGME fellowships of pediatrics, um, thoracic, cardiac, and um, I think that was about it back then. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, those are the kind of classic older ones, pediatrics, right. asthma. Yeah, um, yeah they, they were a few of them. What I'm impressed with, though, is that you were there for 40 years. It's great that you were busy enough that you were able to pass on all these separate, separate specialties away from you, and that didn't affect you know your own volume and, and importance in the hospital and in your department. But 40 years, in yeah. this, right? Well, it's easy. Just come and live in Charlottesville. <laughs> that's what thomas jefferson said so, uh, perfect yeah i'm serious i'm absolutely serious it says the reason i went to charlottesville uh-huh was um when i was in durham i was in the lab and i was working in the lab for scott jones and he was my mentor and and you know and i, and I wanted to make my career just like him and so forth um and we had our lab was across the street the va hospital was across the street from duke and so I was over in his lab in the VA and the VA had, as most VAs, sort of sparse facilities, but the one place that you never went, you never went to the VA cafeteria because the food was absolutely inedible. You just wouldn't go yeah. there. Yeah. He calls us up one day and there was another guy working in the lab with me. He called us up and he said, I want to come have lunch with you guys at the VA. I'm like, what in the <laughs> world? Why would you want to do that? So sure enough, he came over the next day, had lunch with us to tell us that he was leaving Duke to become the chairman at Virginia. So. So for our audience, I think the studies show the average surgeon goes through a, on average three jobs. I'm on my third job. I'm hoping that this will be it. Yeah. And I'm like really happy. I don't know what number are you on Kevin? Three as well. Three. Yeah. yeah. So this is very interesting to me. Yeah. Um, and your situation is rare, especially in academic surgery where people right. move up oftentimes by just moving around. Um, yeah. Well, the, the big decision in my career came around the time, maybe a couple of years before I was sage as president, I was getting offers and looking at chair jobs. And I had to decide whether I wanted to be a chair or not. And uh, I looked at a bunch of chair jobs. And almost every one of them I looked at had something that needed to be fixed that I had, you know, I would have to come in and, and, and make repairs and do, it was like an overhaul of the department. Um, they, I realized also that at that point in my career, I was doing about, about 90% of the time I was doing stuff I loved doing. I was operating, taking care of patients, doing some research. Um, and I had just become program director, which I just love that. So I realized that in talking to my friends who were becoming chairs and people who were chairs, that percentage of my time would go down to about 65%. Because about 35% of your yeah. time you spend in meetings with the dean and other and faculty members who are unhappy and you have to listen to their complaints and try to fix them. And so I decided that it just really wasn't worth it. I decided yeah. I didn't have to be a chairman to uh, be able to contribute. Um, so I decided to put my efforts into you know, working in societies, uh, journals, stuff like that. And that's, and I was pretty happy doing that. Plus I had the benefit of being able to stay in one place, uh, continue to raise my kids in Charlottesville. Uh, they grew up, moved away. They both came back to Charlottesville, um, 2008 or 10 and both got married back in town, picked out great guys. And I have four grandchildren in town who are living right next to me. So oh. in the same town. So how can you go wrong? Yeah, that's, that's pretty, very nice. pretty tough so, to beat. Do you, so do you, besides the Charlottesville um, being a great town outside of Cleveland, Kevin, I understand. Yeah, one, one, I mean, <laughs> there's one other place that would, would have uh, also. Uh, <laughs> but do you think it's, it's, it's you or it's your, it's anything special about your institution that allowed you just to maintain a practice for 40 years? I would say that it's not necessarily just me because our faculty generally don't leave once they come. We have very few people who leave because they're unhappy. We've had people leave because they took advancements to be chairs and stuff like that. Um, you know, in the 38 or so years I've been on the faculty, I think of about seven or eight people over the course of all that time that left because the situation just wasn't right for them. And they really didn't make an upward move. It was more of a lateral move. Um, so that's about it. Most other people have stayed and enjoyed it and, um, or left to become uh, with an upward move. So, so, you, so it's, you, a, yeah, it's just ahead. a great place to work. It's a friendly place. People are happy. It's kind of a little bit of a hidden secret. 
Well, it's getting out now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you might have a rash of, uh, of uh, applicants now. Yeah. So well, you yeah. alluded to this uh, a little bit ago, but a surgical career and a surgical training is quite taxing. And many times we don't give enough credit uh, to those who've supported us along the journey. Yeah. Who, who would you say helped you the most during well, your Well, I mean, my wife has been the most amazing support. We were married um, um, a month before I started medical school, and we've been together ever since. And she has been by my side and been very supportive. And I can't tell you how many times I call her up and say, yeah, well, I'm going to be late for dinner. Go ahead and eat. Just going to be in the OR or just going to, you know, have another conference call or something else to do. And it's, you know, it's just... And that's that's good compared to residency where I just wasn't even home at all. My, I think um, the key. I think the key is you actually call to tell her that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I should probably yeah, do but, that. Yeah, but if it gets uh, too late, then it's it's not so good because she yeah. says I've been waiting. I, you know, I I mean I'm supposed to call around six or before to find out if we're having dinner together. But sometimes all of a sudden I look at the clock and it's seven or seven thirty. I'm like, oops, better call now. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Um, yeah, so I've she's been great, and um, but I've I've also had you know within the department I've had great. I mean, Dr. Jones has been a great mentor, been very supportive of my whole career. Um, at a time where I wanted to do something unusual, he he said yes, and that was laparoscopy. He saw the value of it early on, and um, and encouraged me to do it. And we were we were actually as as far as academic medical centers go, we were one of the first ones to really embrace lap coli. And and do a lot of it. Hmm. That's so, really amazing. And yeah. and you know we've done this is our fourteenth episode. Your name has come up multiple times as a mentor to many of the leaders and sages and and um, important people and sages that we have interviewed. Mm -hmm. So we know that you've become very involved in leader at sages, other surgical societies. What? How were you able to balance? Your clinical workload, you do your research, academics, um, loving family. Plus, I mean, being a mentor takes a lot of time and effort as well. Maybe you can share your tips. Well, um, you know, our, in our, I was able to use my clinical practice to be a mentor to all the residents that trained with me. Uh, and because there's the opportunity, you're working with them every day. And you can you teach them how to do surgery, and um, becoming a mentor just you, you just have to add the additional things of caring about them, what they're going to do with their career, where they go, supporting them afterwards, following them, writing letters for them, keeping in touch with them. Um, and the best thing I've done in my whole career is all the people I've trained. I have uh, I don't know how many it is. Yeah, we saw, I saw that, I saw that on <laughs> your I was program director for 17 years and people said, how could you do that? I'm like, are you kidding? Wow, how cool. could I not do wow. that? It was amazing. It was an amazing job. I had, I had great support. I had a great coordinator. The faculty were supportive. The residents were terrific. It was easy. I had, it was a wonderful job. I loved it. That's great. A again, multiple guests have, have mentioned you as, as being inf influential in getting them involved. Um, Tell us a little bit about when you first learned about sages and and joined. Yeah, so I um I had a strong interest in surgical endoscopy from from my time when I first went to work in a hospital in New York and was in, in a GI unit. So when I went through medical school, I was interested in in uh, in endoscopy. And when I became a surgical resident, I um there most of the surgeons weren't doing that much endoscopy, but we did have a scope over in the clinic. And um, I was very interested in scoping patients, and um, so I it was a it was back then it was a clinic that was basically resident run, so you would set up appointments, so on. So I, I scheduled some patients for some some upper endoscopy, I think it was, and um, I remember I was supposed to I had a senior resident who was busy doing stuff, and I had the first scope I was going to do in the clinic, and I called him, and it was his name it was Bill Myers. Bill Bill is one of my resident mentors. Bill so, Myers in Pennsylvania? Yeah, Bill Myers, who's now really? doing sports hernias. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Bill Myers was very instrumental in me going into surgery. He was my second, he was the second year resident on the service when I was a med student, and he was great. So um I called up Bill. I said, Bill, I, I, of course I was this, I was a he was a 
he was, I did the chief or the senior resident on the service and I was the second year resident. I said, Bill, I'm in clinic, I'm about to do an endoscopy. Um, uh, could you, uh, I, I haven't done one before, could you come and, and give me some pointers? And his, his, his sage advice to me was, can you walk through a door? I said, okay, that's it? <laughs> Said, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so uh, that was to our my... listeners, th that's not it. Uh, so that, <laughs> that's not it. That, that was my formal endoscopy it. training. That was it. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> that's that's the... that's, yeah. Uh, that's a being thrown to the fire moment. In one's... Can you? Yes, walk indeed, the it was. And those wow, those first yeah. few those first few poor patients until I you know figured out where to put the scope in the, in, in the, in the epiglottis. And These were un, and, and, un, uh, sedated uh, procedures, right? These are, no, they were sedated. Yeah, oh, they I, were sedated. Okay. I thought yeah, they were, no, were in clinic. Yeah. Oh, conscious. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, well, those I, patients, I, I, those patients should yeah. be happy to know that it's because of them that you are now who you are. Yeah. So, yeah. I, and so, yeah. yeah so I, I kept doing uh, endoscopy all through my residency and I was very interested in it. And when I got on faculty, I started doing it in my practice. And um, I started on faculty in 85 and um, really didn't hear about sages until about 87 or 88. I think it was 88. And I, it's their society doing endoscopy. There was the big, it was really a society formed to promote surgical endoscopy. I said, yeah, I got to join that because that's, I want to do that. And I think surgeons should do endoscopy and so forth. So I did join and um, it was in 88. And um, I went to the, uh, I, I didn't, but I didn't go to the meeting in 89. I forget it was, it was early and I, I didn't, for some reason I missed it, but I was started to do uh, some diagnostic laparoscopy because that's also, we were, that was something that was available then. So I had a little bit of a, a little bit of um, exposure to laparoscopy. And then in, uh, in the, at the American College meeting in 1989, Jacques Parasat came and did this demonstration about doing lap coles, And that was what kicked yeah. off lap coles in the U.S. It just, it was like a bomb went off. Did um, every was everyone there at the meeting for that presentation? Well, no. <laughs> Jacques, okay. Jacques, Jacques came up and he set up this little uh, video thing in the exhibit hall. Oh. And um, it, he wasn't on the program at all. But before, while he was doing it, all of a sudden you walked in the exhibit hall. What's going on over there? There's 65 or 75 people crowding around him trying to see this video screen. Wow. And, you know, people were just amazed at it. And, um, and I saw it, I heard about it and I said, yeah, this is, having done the diagnostic laparoscopy that I did, I said, yeah, this is, it sounds, as, as I saw the, the first uh, reports on the, how it was done and the data and so on. I thought, yeah, this is something we should do. So I, I talked to Dr. Jones, I said, we need to do this. And he said, absolutely. So I signed up for a course in Chicago. Uh, Mohan Aran and St. Co were the two surgeons that were teaching Lap Coley, and um, there were I think about eight or nine people at the course, and five of us turned out to uh, <clears throat> excuse me turned out to be um, Sage's presidents. It was John Hunter, uh, Nat Soper. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember who else. But anyway. Uh, I'm trying to, I get confused who was there and who was, but anyway, that a bunch of us that went to that course were the people that uh, started some of the early lap Coley stuff. Uh, I can't, I can't, I think Jeff Peters might've been there. And um, anyway, so yeah, that's how I got to meet John and that, and some of the early leaders of Sages. And we uh, started talking about, you know, they at that point had just joined Sages as well. And so we became proponents of the society and got our friends to join and um, went to courses and started teaching courses at our own places and presented at national meetings about laparoscopy. And before you know it, it just took off from there. Yeah, I think that's what's so unique about Sages is it, it's a conglomeration of, of like-minded people and then you kind of grow with each other, you know? Yep same courses and then now you're on similar committees and, and leadership positions yep. Yep. um for our listeners uh many of them are actually quite involved in sages that's why they listen to the podcast as part of the whole sages kind of journey mm -hmm. um and they are probably also trying to make an impact in various committees and programs so i think they can relate to some of the early aspects of your journey what advice would you give to early and mid-career surgeons who hope to make an impact in sages um, if you want to make an impact, be available. Well, half a life is showing up. 
So <laughs> you got to show up for the meetings. You got to show up for uh, your committee meetings. And and um, if there's some work to be done, do it. Uh, and put your energy and effort into it. And people will quickly see the quality of work that you do and the intensity and the dedication you have for the society and and the interest in the work. And and um, that that's what gets you started. I mean, you uh, just just being th- it, it's 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 like becoming a leader of anything. The, the leaders are the people that you just look at that person. You say this person really wants to do this is the best at, is, is worked hard at it, has practiced at it, has got enthusiasm for it. And um, and makes it makes sense to let that person be the leader. So that's that's kind of what what you do. And you, you just just kind of go after it. <laughs> yeah, I think officially you can just email any of the leaders within Sages, preferably the program chair or the president and say, I want to be on your committee. Yeah, and they can I, see if that's feasible. But I personally even just walked into a committee meeting. A friend of mine was like, hey, I'm going to this meeting. Come with me. And now I'm a, now I'm a member. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think that the, yeah. the door's open. Yeah. And it's a very um, it, that's it's always been true of Sages. It's been a, a society that actually welcomes and wants uh, in multiple member involvement and is especially um, amenable to younger people being involved um, there. Um, you know, it, it does take a while to get up the ladder. So it's true that the people who are at the top or they've been around a while, they, the older folks, sure. but uh, but they've put in their dues and they've done their work along the way. And you know, the stuff I did, I, I was, uh, I worked on the resident education committee for a long, long time. We, we, um, at that point, we had to rewrite the requirements for, uh, we, we made some recommendations to the American Board of Surgery about how to incorporate laparoscopy into training. And so that was one of the projects I did. And, um, and um, yeah, that did, so I did a lot of work with that. And that uh, kind of was one of the main things I, I contributed. So Kevin, so, can I make the announcement that you are now um, among the quote older people in the leadership of Sages? Uh, we'll hold off. Aww. I want to congratulate you, like oh, uh, in you. public. Thank you, thank you. Um, too kind, sure. Uh, so when when you reflect back, so believe it or not, it's been twenty years since you were right. president. You were yep, president yep. twenty years ago. Um, it's been, uh, you know, I think surgery has changed significantly when you think back and you reflect on your time uh, in as the leader what were some of the major issues facing both sages and the field of surgery at that time well uh at that time uh, yeah I, I um we hadn't really come upon notes yet but it was pretty clear that, in, and in fact, my presidential speech talked a little bit about um, not only using the laparoscope, but using the endoscope for our future surgical procedures, and that uh, we needed to make sure that the surgery in the next 10 years was better than the surgery of the last 10, and we needed to be op- always open to innovation and and look forward to, to doing that. So um, yeah, shortly after my time is when uh, the notes Uh, first got started you know people were taking gallbladders out through the mouth and stuff like that which maybe wasn't such a great thing um but uh, yeah (laughs) um great but that's where that's where the the the, uh, enthusiasm for endoscopy got started and then um you know so now we have poems and we have other things like that that are endoscopically based treatments and um and and at that point also i was a bariatric surgeon and it was around uh, 2000 that um, bariatric surgery took off laparoscopically. And so there was a huge, uh, I had just, just gone through about a three-year increase in bariatric mm-hmm. surgery. Um, numbers of procedures went uh, up about 400% or 500% in the country because of laparoscopy. So that was, and that was really the main, last main, other than HPV, that was the last main area of abdominal surgery that hadn't been done laparoscopically, but now was clearly being done laparoscopically and clearly was for the morbidly obese patients, a great, uh, a super uh, benefit to them in terms of incisional hernias and, and uh, recovery and, and uh, trauma to the abdominal wall and so forth. The, 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 less, the lessening of all that made the operations much, much better and uh, much more accepted. So, um, but that, so that was what was going on then, I think is the big issues. Uh, politically, there was some stuff I was trying to do and uh, was 
a marginally successful a few years after my presidency, and that was to try to have joint meetings. We're trying to get one big joint spring meeting. And uh, there was a period of time, I think it was either two or three years, we actually did have uh, both SAGES and the HPBA meet at the same time in the same location. Um, and I thought that was really going to be a good thing. And people would want to do that because they could, the cross registration was easy. You could go to the half a day at one meeting and half at the other. And I thought it would really take off. But as it turned out, as time went by, the cultures really wanted their own meeting. So HPBA really wanted their own meeting separated back again. Um, but that was, I spent some effort doing that. I remember that. Yeah. yeah I, I remember that was right around the time I was in training. And I, I, I can tell you that was a, a really interesting concept. And I think I, I was one of the people who did appreciate it um, for, for what it's worth. I, I agree with you. It's, it's definitely gone back to, yeah. you know, well, it would have been, you know, it's just but, one, one less trip you had to take one yeah. less meeting to go to, and you could accomplish a lot by going to the, to the full meeting and, and going to both societies. It just seemed like a win-win and it was for both societies for the time being. And then, um, but it just dissolved. And I can understand each one wanting to, it was more HPBA wanted to have their own identity. They felt like they were overpowered by sages. So what yeah, are a lot of people? Yeah. Um, yeah. We, 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 we talked a little bit about some of the interesting interactions between, you know, sages and other societies, Dr. Ponsky talked about those a little bit in one of the podcasts. Um, so uh, we, we know that you were also in many of those discussions in those years. When you, when you think back, um, what are some of the most exciting changes? You, I think you alluded to a few of them in surgery that you've seen in, in such a long, illustrious career. Well, I mean, there's no question laparoscopy is the biggest, absolutely the biggest one. And um the other stuff kind of is is minor compared to that. Um, it just changed it changed ninety percent of operations that we do uh, in the abdomen. I mean, there's there's not that much that we do um, that we do um, you know that we don't do minimally invasively now. So yeah. I mean, it's even even coming to the point where we do donor livers, you know, uh, minimally invasively. So yeah. it's uh it's it's a, it was a game changer, a big game changer, and and it did it not only um allowed us to do the operations better in the sense that it was less traumatic to the patients and stuff but it really also helped us appreciate the patients uh you know prior to that surgeons didn't think as much about post op pain they didn't think as much about post op wound complications um it was just part of business you just you know you got hernias and you got wound infections and you you know the patients needed a bunch of morphine and stuff like that but here was an, a way to avoid all that and all of a sudden you realize, wow, and you know, the, you could see how much better the patients did. And you, I think it really helped surgeons appreciate their patients, what their patients went through more a, a lot. And, that, and I thought that was really important. So. Yeah, and I think you alluded to, you know, how you were trained. And even when I was a resident, there was no laparoscopic fellowship, um, official one, you know, that we had to do right. a match. But, and then, then Kevin was born. And uh, now that we have the fellowship council, um, <laughs> the youngin so, in the room, the <laughs> you're the baby, <laughs> the baby. Um, but we know that an area you devote a lot of energy to was specifically in the specialty training of surgeons after residency, mm -hmm. mostly in your work with the fellowship council. Um, for yeah. those of you who may not be surgeons or are medical in nature, as listeners, a general surgeon usually trains for a minimum of five years after four years of medical school or three and a half years of medical school in your case, and can technically start practicing as a surgeon um, after that. But I think the statistics are somewhere between 90 and 100% of graduates end up doing extra training. And that could be an extra one to three years of a subspecialty training. And the fellowship council was set up to provide a framework for the training of these graduate fellows, especially in laparoscopic, um, minimally invasive surgery and and um, offshoots of, of that. So Bruce, maybe you can tell us a little about the evolution of the Fellowship Council. Sure, that, that's actually a really good story. Um, so we, we, started doing, we started doing lap coles in 1990 and um, it was just the wild west. Uh, you, you, if you wanted to try to, if you were out in practice, you had to try to find some place to go to learn how to do it. There were good courses and not such good courses. and um, the, 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 
the big issue was there was a shortage of instruments uh, and there was a shortage of opportunities to learn. And so uh, if you could find a good course where you could learn how to do it, that was really great. And then you had to kind of be pretty careful. And most surgeons were. The, the bile duct injury rate did go up. But, you know, overall, when you think about what a major change it was and how to do the operation, I think most surgeons were pretty careful. And we put on a lot of courses and we had a pretty good track record of our, of our students doing very well out in their practices and, and being very careful. And they had a tough case, they would send it and they would call up for advice and stuff. And so um, in that kind of an environment, people did learn, but it was, it was about a five year process till people really got up to speed. And then people started doing other things as well, colon surgery, anti-reflux surgery, hernias, that sort of thing. And so um, as the diversity and as stuff went on, then people would finish their training and say, you know, I want to learn how to do this too, but I really didn't get a great opportunity during my training because during those years in many institutions, the attendings were learning how to do it and the residents would get maybe some experience, but maybe not. And the number of advanced laparoscopic cases that residents were doing uh, when in, in like 2005 was they were finishing with like 10 advanced laparoscopic cases in their whole experience. It was really yeah. low. Yeah. So that's that was the, the banner that I held up and said, we've got to fix this. We've got to make training better for learning laparoscopy. But not only that, but then if people come out and they're not that well trained, we have to provide frameworks for which they can find places that are legitimate and good experiences and high quality training for them to learn how to do laparoscopy. Because at that point, it was totally, again, a, a, an unorganized system. There were some great people who had, who had great fellowships like Lee Swanstrom and people like that, but there were other places where, you know, they would hire three guys to carry their briefcase and, you know, watch me do my surgery and exactly. I'll, let you do a, yeah. I'll let you do a few in May and then you'll be done. And so it wasn't at all um, equitable and good. So we, there were a bunch of us that uh, did, had MIS type uh, training and we, we met and we come, there was a, the fellowship uh, uh, there's a group of fellowship directors through SAGES mainly. And then the other societies, the SSAT and the HPBA uh, uh, also, and then also later the ASMBS wanted to get involved as well. So the leadership of, um, of basically the SSAT and HPBA and sat down with the, all the program directors from the fellowship uh, society at SAGES. And um, the, fellow, the, the people in, in SAGES really had the experience and 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 the um, the numbers and the the, the sort of the, the kind of had the corner on the market, but uh, what they were willing to do was to try to incorporate these other societies and their frameworks to help set uh, guidelines for good training, and um, so we sat down and we drafted um, uh, basically a. Um, uh, uh, the rules and regulations for what a fellowship should be. Uh, people like Mark, Mike Sarr were very involved with doing this uh, and um, uh, and Henry Pitt and then Keith Lillimo. And, you know, so the, these were older GI guys who have been do mostly open GI surgery, but then there was yeah. John Hunter and there was Lee Swanstrom and there was um, uh, Nat Soper uh, and, and guys like that who were MIS. And so we all sat together, figured out what would be, and we did borrow a lot from the current, uh, fellowship guidelines that the ACGME used for other fellowships. We had a, a recommendation for working hours, but it wasn't as strict. We had recommendations for um, conditions and, and, you know, when you, you know, employment conditions and stuff like that. We had a recommendation for numbers of cases, case minimums. <laughs> so we kind of set all that up and um, then started accrediting programs. And we started in 2005 uh, to actually, or 2005 or six to actually start accrediting programs. And within two years, we had accredited about 120 programs and it went from there. It's amazing. That's huge. It's huge. Yeah. What a, what a just giant. <laughs> and I was, I was the chair of the accreditation committee. I can tell you it was huge. <laughs> it's <laughs> such I got, a giant I, task. I called up about six of my very, very best friends and said, will you please be on this committee? Oh, and we yeah. met, we met in evenings. We would start at eight o'clock. And my promise to everyone was we'd start at eight, but we'd be done at nine and we'd be do, we'd do like six programs in an hour. We just knock them right out. Wow. And uh, yeah, but we did that every week for quite a while. <laughs> so. So that was 
how the accreditation got started. And um, the fellowship council's grown since then, but that was probably what we did in those first couple of years still represents about half of the, or more of the fellowships that, that were existing. Cause we went over, we went uh, up to about a hundred um, um, fellows with about 80 programs. Now with that, did you, um, you know, at that time, did that also coincide with your roles in leadership and president of AHPBA and those types of yeah. things? Yeah, I was okay. uh, AHPBA president in 2008. So okay. I was so um, kind of matched up. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we, you know, we wanted to, um, we knew that, we know that your time is precious. We wanted to, um, we're going to ask a couple more questions, but before we go, I'm going, we're going to do a question and a segment. This question, I have to give credit where credit is due. I, I heard this question on another podcast called Off the Table. It's a podcast that focuses on global surgery, mm -hmm. and I think it's fantastic, so I'm stealing it from them. And that is, if you were to recommend to us who our next Sages Stories guest would be, who would you choose to hear from? Oh, gosh. Um, That's a good one, Kevin. I know. So I stole it from the Off the Table podcast, if you're listening. I, uh, I am totally ignorant quick. about who you've had on. Oh, that's true. So you, you, if you choose someone, we may have had them on. So um, if you say, we'll tell you if we, if we already had them on. So the, um, there's a couple of people that I, I was very uh, instrumental in getting them involved with Sages. And one would be Jerry Freed. We got, had him last time. <laughs> so. And another was David Ratner. We haven't hit Ratner yet. Okay, so we'll, we'll add He's on our list, list, though. Yeah, he's on our list. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, and David and I did a, a book on outpatient surgery together, and uh, that's how we met. And um, I told him about Sages, and I convinced him to join. Okay. Uh, and Jerry Freed and I met. We had to both give presentations when we were in the lab. He was in Jim Thompson's lab at Galveston, and I was in Scott Jones's lab at, at uh, Duke. And we had breakfast together at this meeting of the Southern Surgical and because um, we both had presentations that day. Uh, and so that's how we met and kept in touch after that. So great. And our, our last segment is called the We Are the Sages segment. We are the sages. Sing it, everybody. We are the ones who make you cry our day, so let's not cheating. Have you had a good time tonight? And for this, we want you to think back on all the Sages meetings you've attended. Maybe you know how many you've attended um, and tell us about your favorite moment. And <laughs> we, we, all, we always give people- See, a everyone bit of, laughs at that one. A, a fav, a, well, some I, license to share a few of your favorite moments. I can like. tell you about my most famous moment. Oh. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. My most famous moment was the meeting we had with the AHPBA and it was in Florida. Um, it was, it, it was not in, it wasn't in, uh, I can't remember which city it was in. I think it might've been just outside of Fort Lauderdale, but, um, we were doing the, um, it was in Hollywood, Hollywood, Florida. Yeah, it was, yeah. In, you're right. It was in Hollywood. And so it was time to do the, um, the, the lap wrapper meet, uh, you know, routine. <laughs> So we all got up on the stage and we had a chorus line going across. So was, was AHPBA there too? Like they, yeah, yeah they, I think so. Yeah, they were, they were yeah. both there. Okay. And so I, 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 we had this chorus line going across as in usual lap wrapper um, process. And it was our final number. And we were doing like a, a, uh, a Rockettes kick thing, you know, bound, kicking our legs and walking forward, walking back, kicking, kicking. <laughs> and so we slowly moved the chorus line back <laughs> But what we didn't realize is the back left corner of the stage had a cutout and there was no floor oh. there. Ooh. And I was the guy on the end of the line. Oh, and no. so everybody said that they saw the line go back and I just disappeared. <laughs> oh boy. Oh and I, I literally fell off the stage. Oh. It was about 12 feet high. Oh. Wow. But wow. fortunately it was Sandy. So I landed okay. Oh. Um, I didn't feel any pain, probably because of uh, some uh, liquid medication. Medication, yes, yes, yes. There's some, yes. And so, um, 
it wasn't and, and but I oh. I climb I actually climbed back up on the on the scaffolding and got back up on the stage. Before. But nobody else, they all recognized <laughs> at that point. You were the everybody canary, in the audience was like, ah, the where'd he go? Canary in the mind, <laughs> oh but nobody god. else on the line felt doctor in the you. house. Yeah. Oh my god. Well, I mean, so I, I I felt pretty good, except for about three days later I went running and my knee just blew up. <laughs> so yeah, it turned out I had chipped uh, some cartilage and i had to have arth- arthroscopic surgery to get it out <laughs> oh for real oh, oh wow <laughs> oh man wow so anyway so that was my most famous sages moment other wow. than maybe giving my presidential speech but i'm not that, sure that may take it. the cake that yeah, so I, far, I think they remember that more than my presidential speech yeah that that may take the cake <laughs> yeah that was a, that's a good story do your does your family come to the meetings um they came for my presidential one and jerry's been to a couple of others um uh, but not regularly because usually I'm so involved. I'm not even, a, you know, I'm not around. I'm in, I'm in the meeting the whole time. And so yeah, it's, true. It's, yeah. True. And have your children followed your path in any way? Um, just peripherally, uh, not, uh, not professionally. My uh, oldest daughter uh, went to Princeton and was a, an English major. And she um, has had a number of um, things she's worked at, but she now has a home design company. Uh, my nice. youngest daughter, went to Elon and she has, um, she was a, um, uh, a major in communications and now is a guidance counselor at one of our um, local uh, high schools. Well, she'll have to listen and, and give us uh, a grade on our communications with you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she will have learned a lot about uh, yeah. how to, how to do podcasts and radio and internet. So, or, you know. There's three things in life. Okay, okay, so there's, tell us there's three things in life that you really can't control. Mm-hmm. One is your health, which is pretty obvious. You can't control that. Uh, and the second is who your kids marry. Yeah. And the third is where your kids finally wind up living. Aww. And I've been extremely lucky with all three because um, my kids married incredible guys, two of the best son-in-laws in the world. Um, and my health has been good. And uh, my, I have... Then my kids moved back to town. So my grandkids are one's five mi- one, two or five miles and two or 13 miles away from me. So we see them all the time and you, you can't get better than that. And you can't get luckier than that. Yeah, that's, that's great. You know, Ponsky had a very similar kind of outlook and yeah. experience with life. Yeah, Jeff Ponsky shared a, a very similar, you know, story about it's very, you know, he kind of has a similar setup with his grandkids and kids being very close by. So mm-hmm. it, it's, yeah. uh, it's great. Yeah. Thank I you hope for that I am that. as, as, yeah. as blessed well, and lucky as, as that. Yeah. I wish you, I wish you well in those areas. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So interviews. this is amazing. This was so much fun on behalf of the entire stage of story audience. Kevin, I really want to thank you, Bruce, for helping us kick off 2023. Yeah. Those are great stories and yeah. so inspirational and the fall is very memorable. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, um, it was, uh, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, just went right off the stage. <laughs> yeah. Uh, will you be in Montreal for the 20? I will for sure. Meeting? Yeah. Yeah. In awesome. fact, um, I'm trying to organize. We have a pretty good number of our group going. So I think we're going to rent a house uh, up at Montreal and go skiing afterwards. Oh, great. Very nice. Yeah. Great. Yeah. For everyone, uh, if you haven't already done so, it's time to register and book your travel arrangements. The 2023 Sages annual meeting will be held in Montreal, Canada. March 29th through April 1st are the official dates. We hope to see you all there. What are you going to do, Kevin? You're going to show up? Oh, I'll be there. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I'll be the one fully covered from head to toe. With yeah, we won't recognize her. She'll she'll have her mask and her her parka and everything. We'll have two parkas. Actually, I I didn't recognize her in Denver. We're going to be in trouble in Montreal. She was struggling in Denver. She had. She, her whole face was covered in Denver, so it. <laughs> yeah. I don't do well, well in cold weather. Let's just hope it's not too bad there. Yeah, um, yeah. it'll be we'll fun. See. We'll see. Yeah, lots of pre medication. <laughs> mm-hmm. So thank you very much. Until then, everyone, have a great start of the new year. Thanks for joining us, and thank you again, Bruce, for your time and stories. And really looking forward to Montreal. Thanks for the pleasure and honor of being asked to do uh, participate and uh, go Sages. Go thank Sages. You. Thank you. And that wraps up today's episode of Sage's Stories. You can view the show notes for any links to sites we referenced today. Visit sages.org for membership information, 
and for the most recent news from our society. Follow us on Twitter at Sages underscore updates. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. See you again next time. And remember, you can't spell minimally invasive surgery without Sages.